Okay, good morning. Good morning to the SCTS interactive uh, webinar. This is the university session. I'm pleased to uh, be chairing this today. I've got uh, my co-chairs Torsten Dunz um, from, the, uh, from Jena, uh, Prakash Punjabi, Professor Punjabi from the Hammersmith, and uh, Clinton Lloyd may join us later, but unfortunately he's just been pulled into a, an emergency surgery. I'll introduce our speakers individually as we go along, but I'm really pleased to introduce our first session with um, Mr. Frank Wells, who doesn't need much introduction, but he's a very established mitral valve surgeon from Papworth Hospital, uh, internationally recognized, and we all know his love for art also transgresses into his mitral valve surgery. And I've heard Frank talk a little bit about his links with art in the past in New York, but I'm really looking forward to this session today. Uh, about the anatomy of the mitral valve, Leonardo to today. Thank you. Can we roll the session, please? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure, pleasure and privilege to share these thoughts with you today. Um, I've been asked to speak about the anatomy of the mitral valve from Leonardo da Vinci to where we are now. Just to begin with, um, valves were observed by the ancients, but their role in heart function was not understood at all as we would today. Uh, even the great Galen in the first century AD he actually thought that the valve, the mitral valve, allowed advancement of the blood and its egress for the sooty vapours to be absorbed through the trachea, which he thought was connected to the left atrium. So you can see he was quite far away from what we know today. However, Alessandro Benedetti, a 15th century anatomist and surgeon, saw the valves for the first time as unidirectional structures. He called them valvulae from the word valva, meaning a leaf of a folding gore. Around the time of Leonardo, Jacopo Berengario de Carpi, a Bolognese surgeon of great repute and a really good anatomist, produced um, towards the end of his life the Isagogues, first one in 1524, based on the anatomy of Mondino. And you can see these woodcuts from his illustrated uh, anatomical text, but you can also see how extremely crude they are in terms of any kind of functional understanding. It wasn't until Vesalius published De Fabrica in 1540 that a better and truer understanding of, of heart uh, anatomy, and particularly valve structure, was available for students of medicine and anatomy. But even in Vesalius's De Fabrica, the um, information regarding functional uh, anatomy or physiology, as we would call it today, is very sparse. He is the one who named the valve, however, and these are his words. He wrote, at the root of the circle of the venous artery, which we know as the left atrium, a membranous circle, valva atrioventricular sinistra, originates in the substance of the heart, the atrioventricular junction, and goes inward into the space of the left ventricle. When it descends a little way into the space of the ventricle, it splits into two membranous processes, resembling in shape those of the right ventricular membranes, being, however, of only two rather than three on the right side. They are greater in strength than those in the right ventricle because the membranous circle of the venous artery, the left atrium, is split into only two membranes. You would not be wrong in comparing them to a bishop's mitre if you compare the part encircling the head of the membranous circle and its process to the front and the back points of the mitre. So this is the first clear comparison of the mitral valve to the bishop's mitre uh, and the, the word that we use today. Again, the woodcuts in the fabrica 
are relatively cute, crude. They are more accurate than uh, Berengario's Escort, but still they don't really um, describe what we're used to seeing and don't really uh, get into the physiology of valve and heart function. Fabricius, who was Harvey's teacher just around this time, was far sighted in his appreciation of the function of valves and may have been the one to encourage Harvey to speculate upon the need for a continuous circulation by the fact of the presence of the aortic valve. He quoted the pulse rate times left ventricular volume was equivalent to cardiac output, and where did this volume of blood go? He compared the valves of the heart and the veins with mechanical hydraulic valves. Another teacher of Harvey, Bohan, who wrote a complete treatise on all the valves in the body, including the colonic valve, which he was the first to describe, claimed to have invented the use of the term mitral valve, clearly hadn't read the fabrica. Sadly, he obfuscated his theory by continuing to insist on a galenic circulation. So sandwiched between all of this was Leonardo da Vinci. On the left here, you see a drawing from the Bodleian in Oxford of the state of understanding of anatomy in England in the late 13, early 1400s. And I think you'd all agree with me that you wouldn't really want to do much cardiac surgery based on that. However, in 1482, about 70 years later, this drawing uh, was made by Leonardo. It's the first known anatomical drawing, um, and it shows still a galenic circulation with the liver at the center of the circulation, which is what Galen believed. The heart is a two-chambered structure, but it's beginning to resemble the cardiovascular system that we might actually uh, uh, see today and, and understand today. The interesting thing about this little drawing are the words by his right shoulder, which basically says, this heart looks a pretty interesting structure. I better come back and have a closer look. And of course he did about 30 years later. His um, attention to detail in an anatomical dissection could be seen in these words. And I won't read through them all, but simply to point out that he dissected many bodies very, very carefully. And he did this in a way um, that really revealed anatomy in its truest form. And he repeated it twice over, as he says, to discover differences between people. So it's the beginning of early, um, more pure anatomical thought and research. The process was pretty awful. And in these words, you can see how bad it might have been. He said, and though you have a love for such things, you'll perhaps be impeded by your stomach. And if this doesn't impede you, you'll be impeded by the fear of living through the night hours in a company of quartered and flayed corpses, fearful to behold. He goes on to say how carefully he worked and his knowledge of parallel knowledge in geometry, hydrology, engineering, and so forth, enhanced his understanding of what he found. Um, and he described writing this in 120 books, which is probably a shorthand for sheaves of paper, not books, because there's no evidence that he did produce, produce that in his lifetime. The common denominators of thought between Harvey and Leonardo, however, leading to the suggestion of the circulation are the presence of valves, both cardiac and venous, and the cardiac output, stroke volume to a pulse rate. And Leonardo mentions this in his notes, as well as uh, Harvey. Let's turn now to Leonardo's mitral valve. In the summer of 1504, while sailing off the island of Elba, he noted, looking up at the sails on the boat, give the names to the cordy, tenderness cords, which open and shut these two sails of the mitral valve, that is, call the main one the bowline, top mast, and the like. So he's likening the opening and closing of the mitral valve to sails in the wind, and the support apparatus of the tenderness cords and the papillary muscles like the ropes and capstans on a ship. So again, he's beginning to think in a much more advanced way of the interaction between the valve and the ventricle. Uh, this beautiful drawing showing the underside of an ox mitral valve shows the arcading of the primary, secondary, and tertiary cords. It also shows the relationship of the aortic valve to the mitral valve. Uh, and in other parts of it, you can see where he play, took the plane of section to demonstrate the interstices of the ventricle. Now, I'll show you this drawing because there is a church in Milan that was thought to be a partly designed by Leonardo using the architecture that he found beneath the mitral valve as a stimulus, as an idea. And I want you just to note that how accurate this idea is and why are these architectural designs the shape they are? 
Well, they are to bear the weight and load of the roof. And I just want to come back to this later on because the mitral valve at end systole is actually a force field. And what you see is there to withstand the forces on the mitral valve. He wrote on the atrioventricular leaflet closure on the valves of the heart, on the shutting of the heart, the valve cusps of the heart always give passage first to a quantity of blood before they shut from within outwards. And this is really taken from Galenic ideas that the valve had to leak to allow some blood back into the left atrium to allow the sooty vapors to escape through the lungs. Later on, he changes his mind. And he says, the cores which arise from the muscles of the heart and are converted into the membranes, which become the cusps of the great valves of the heart are those which hold the cusp of the valve so they do not pass out of the opening, but with their extension, they increase and are applied to each other, making perfect closure. No other he, he realizes therefore that the valve has to close perfectly, which therefore turns thought to the forward flow of the blood. Here he draws the tricuspid valve very beautifully, but as you can see, he actually delineates uh, the uh, coarctation height between the little letters A and B and C and D uh, on the leading edge of the leaflets. And uh, he wrote about this need for coarctation height to give perfect closure of the valve. So again, it mirrors what we're thinking and using today in mitral valve repair. This is a, a, a photograph on the left of an ox mitral valve, which is what he was drawing. And on the right, you can see how accurate his representation of the primary and secondary cause uh, really was. In this extraordinary drawing on the right, he's dissected out the tertiary cord. And I've done the same dissection on the left, and you can again see how accurate it was. But the striking thing for me is why on earth would someone want to dissect a heart out to this level of detail? But they really didn't understand the true physiology of the structure. Here's another little door diagram showing the coarctation line, which he described the lips of the junctions of the membranes are bent down in this manner. And we spend uh, much of our time doing mitral valve repair trying to achieve this. Uh, this summary page shows so many interesting features from his anatomical studies, from the planes of uh, incision to show the septum. Uh, but the one that strikes me most is the one that's circled in the middle, which is a little drawing of pulleys and ropes. And actually, he describes the interaction between the mitral valve and the left ventricle as an important component of left ventricular function. Here is the first diagram, probably of a rheumatic valve, where he describes the os cordis, uh, which he sees in other species, but describes the cartilage and some bony structure that he found in this um, uh, patient, per person, I should say. Here is the tricuspid valve beneath, and here is a real one above, and you can see how accurate his representation is of this structure. He was the first to describe the moderator band, which he uh, shows here in the ox heart, which he filled with hot wax, allowed the wax to set, the heart to go into rigor mortis, and then dissected the heart off the wax, showing the interstices of the ventricle with the closed tricuspid valve, uh, as it would be in the working heart. You can see the human heart does have occasionally moderator bands, but is not as well developed as it is in the ox. And here is a human uh, vow, heart, the only human drawing uh, remaining in his collection, probably done in Rome when he was working with the Pope. Uh, and you can see how accurate the interstices of the right ventricle and the tricuspid valve are compared with the actual uh, heart itself. The drawings that you see are pretty much all taken from the ox heart. And here is an ox heart just to show you how accurate his drawings are. And in one of his drawings, he shows a beautiful representation of a cross section of the ventricle, which we uh, mimicked uh, in this same way. And here you can see the cross section of the, of the actual heart against his own drawings. And in the top right hand section, you can see what look like tendinous cords crossing from the papillary muscle to the septum. Uh, they're actually false cords, but if you look in the middle drawing of Leonardo's and the lower line, you can see he's seen exactly the same thing and represented it very, very accurately. These are some of the features that he describes for the first time, the cordal insertion to the mitral valve, the doming of the valve, the scallop posterior leaflets, the depth of pericomachal leaflets and the relationship to the aortic valve, all very modern thought. Following Leonardo, this is the first major anatomical tome since the Fabrica. It's called the Humani Corporis Centum 
and cringy tabulus uh, from 1685. And here you can see the quality of representation now that they're moving from woodcut into copper plate engraving, and we're getting a much more accurate representation of the bowel. Uh, the Atlas of Anatomy for Surgeons by Bourgerie, that many of you all know, uh, also has some very beautiful representations of the bowel, taking us pretty much to the sort of thing that we're used to looking at today. Now, you know, all know, Carpentier's lesion classification for mitral valve regurgitation types one to three, and the remedies associated with them to mend these valves. However, is the valve really like this? Is the physiology really like this? And perhaps we should think in a different paradigm. I just want to draw your attention to one other book by Darcy Wentworth Thompson on growth and form, where he talks about form to function in all things in nature. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. And he actually quotes Leonardo in the book, where he says that all forms of an object in nature, a diagram of the forces acting upon it. Uh, now, why do I tell you that? But I'd like you to look at the mitral valve as a force field representing the forces that act upon it. Here is the typical representation of the valve with the aortic and mural leaflets, the commissural cords and the papillary muscles. And on the right, you see the physiological representation of the valve next to the aortomitral curtain and the aortic valve and the structures around it. We all like to talk about the saddle shape of the valve, and here it is represented. But how often do we think what the saddle shape really is? It is formed by the tension left ventricular outflow tract. And that part of the aortomitral curve is one third of the circumference of the valve. And here you can see it in this working echocardiogram as opposed to the diagram on the left. And I point this out because I believe that complete rigid rings is an anathema to a physiologically repaired mitral valve. A band from trigone to trigone, allowing the aortomitral curtain and the anterior leaflet to take up its normal form is what we should be doing, uh, again, in my opinion. Now let's think about how the valve evolves or how it's made. This is the uh, uh, minor representation of the embryology of the valve, and you know they grow from the atrioventricular cushions in the heart tube. Those are the leaflets, and the papillary muscles are uh, developed from the trabeculated myocardium. Now, if you look on the face of the valve, as the aorta of, um, uh, of uh, the um, atrioventricular cushions develop and the leaflets grow forwards, they can grow at differential rates. And these differential rates are what give rise to the clefts or indentations of the valve. We still don't know exactly how the cords are formed, but this photograph on the right, which is you might recognize, is a shoe with chewing gum underneath it. And if you do this, it does this every time, shows you how the forces are distributed along these stretched structures. And I wonder whether the force of the ventricle between the developing leaflets and the wall of the ventricle actually cause the cords to fall into line as we see them, representing the major areas of stress. If you have these deep clefts, which you virtually always do in prolapsing mitral valves, or if you don't, there's another feature we'll come into a moment, areas of the valve can come under undue pressure and stretch, get cordal stretch, leaflet stretch, and cordal rupture. And here's a classic example of a P2 example, a P2 prolapse with large clefts on either side, giving an isolated piece of posterior leaflet, which then is exposed to the same force per square centimetre or surface area as the rest of the valve, uh, which is isolated portion with often uh, inadequate uh, caudal support will stretch and the cause of entry rupture. So the normal indentations, which stretch for no more than a third of the height of the leaflet, are there to allow maximal opening and maximal cardiac output. The deep clefts to the annulus, however, are abnormal. And these abnormal clefts allow isolation of these portions of the leaflet. In addition to that, if you look below the leaflet, this is what you commonly find in patients with severe mitral regurgitation. And these are abnormal papillary muscles. Very few people ever talk about them. They are commonly there. But of course, if they are abnormal and the distribution of caudal origin from them to the leaflets is abnormal, then the normal sharing of stress on the leaflet itself will not be normal leading to abnormal areas of heightened stress, cordal, uh, cordal elongation, and uh, leaflet stretching. And I contend that all degenerative mitral valve disease is a later manifestation of congenital malformation. And here is an extreme example 
where the uh, leaflet is not grown forwards at all, and part of the papillary muscle is still fused to the ventricular wall, uh, but you'll see the cords going out into the base of the indentation, uh, showing that this is something that's been there since birth. This is not a late, uh, strange, rheumatic presentation. It's a congenital abnormality. If we then look at the leaflets themselves in, de in detail, we commonly find extreme differences in leaflet height. So the force that those heightened leaflets are exposed to is going to be greater than a smaller leaflet, which can share the load, especially if there are deep clefts. The other part of my argument, which uh, I think strengthens it, is the fact that these cords go all the way out to the clefts, showing the depths of the clefts or indentations, showing that it is a congenital lack of formation and lack of forward growth. Here's another highly abnormal papillary muscle showing how the commissural support just isn't there for this valve, which over time will stretch, prolapse, and give severe regurgitation. Here's another example where the usual infralateral papillary muscle, which should be a horseshoe, is broken up into separate heads uh, with a further separate head that you can't see to the aortic leaflet. Here is another example of extreme differences in a non barlows valve of the mural leaflets, both their height and the depths of the indentations between the leaflets. All these valves are completely repairable and the repair is much more satisfactory and easy to accomplish if you truly understand what's been going on in the development of the valve. I throw this slide and you'll remember from the early uh, mitral meetings that Professor Caponti ran, which were superb, he used to refer to the, lower, the reference point, which he said never prolapsed. Therefore, it could always be used for reference, but you know that's not true. And the reason the reference point here is stretched and prolapsing, because there's a deep indentation between P1 and P2, and then there's a commissure above it, leaving that area unsupported. And as you can see, there's little caudal support also. Uh, and this was easily repaired with a triangular resection imbrication. And here's another example of a deep indentation with cords going all the way to the annulus uh, and the differential height of the mural leaflet. So in summary, the, the valve has come of age, we understand it much better, but we still speak too much didactically about it. I don't think enough of us think physiologically and embryologically about the valve. And if you truly understand the embryology of the valve, it will help you decide what the lesions are, what needs to be fixed and how to fix it. So I end with the quote from um, Vasilis again, who said, whom not admonished, plays the fool with the bishop's mitre. In summary, the left atrioventricular valve is a complex derivative of natural forces, which sometimes is malformed. These malformations lead to excessive stress on parts of the valve, which lead to the changes that we see when a patient presents with a malfunctioning valve. A full understanding of its embryology and physiology can allow a better appreciation of its lesions and the methods to repair and reconstruct them. Thank you for the privilege of presenting these observations to our society.
points, you'll see that the forces are equal and opposite. They always draw arrows in both directions. Um, but the point is that wherever you get excess force in any direction, you need to strengthen it. So if you look at the, the disposition of the secondary cores, they spread out on the roof, showing that they are there for strength. The leading cores, the primary cores, as has been shown many, many times now in N-Systole, are loose. And you know there's endless um, video footage to show that. The primary cores <laughs> simply allow the leaflets to drift together for coaptation and stop prolapse. Once they prolapse, you've lost all control. Once they're together, and the, you, what, again, people don't talk about the vortices underneath the mitral leaflets, pushing the, co the coaptive surface together, all the force is on those secondary cords. So the analogy, I think, still holds. Um, but, you know, we have to discuss it in greater depth. But that, that's the idea. Whether it's pushing or pulling, you've got to resist the force somehow. Frank, uh, I've, I've never seen a mitral presentation with some chewing gum in there. But I thought that was a beautiful picture that you had. I've got so many questions that I want to ask you, but I know time is short. But um, I, I'm wondering if you can uh, give us an insight in, into where is this journey taken you? How on earth did you manage to capture all these beautiful images and learn about the, all this history? Well, it, it, I want to be an architect, not a surgeon. My mother told me to get a proper job. That's where it all started. Um, but no, I've been fascinating from the beginning. And I think, you know, one of the things you read uh, in learning uh, Renaissance philosophy and so forth is to think widely, and exactly as Thurston and I were just discussing then, looking at things that we see every day in a new way and apply knowledge and information from other specialties, which is really the fascination of Leonardo for me. He's not alone, of course. Newton, many others did it. Um, but it gets you looking at things differently. And why I just challenge the simple paradigm P1, P2, P3 of, of Carpentier, that's very nice for looking at Lenko, talking to cardiologists and knowing roughly which bit you're talking about. It's got nothing to do with the real mitral valve. And you know you have indentations anywhere along the neural leaflet and so forth. So then you start to ask yourself the question, why do we see what we see? And we see what we see because of the way the valve is formed, which takes you back to embryology. And we see what we see because of the forces on the developing valve. And we do forget a lot of the time because we look at the heart relaxed and opened or on a post-mortem bench. It is a tremendous interaction between the forces in the blood and the wall of the heart. Uh, it's a two-directional thing. So really, if you just start to think in those, it just makes it more fun, more interesting. I think it takes it a little bit closer to the truth. And when you're trying to repair them, as you all do very beautifully, I know, um, if you just think about those things, it might make you do one or two things slightly differently. And also, probably, recognize secondary and tertiary and occasionally quaternary lesions. You might list, miss, because they don't show up on the straightforward echo done by a regular cardiologist. So it just helps you to think differently, I think. Thank you, Frank. It was a great presentation. Um, so I'm going to move on now. So our next, present our next speaker is Mr. Joseph Zacharias from Blackpool, consultant cardiac surgeon in Blackpool, a real advocate of minimally invasive surgery in the UK and across Europe um, over the last 10 years. He's developed uh, techniques in beating heart, minimal access surgery, fibrillating heart, and uh, practices redo procedures through the same route. Uh, I know in addition, recently he's been looking at various literature and emotional intelligence in surgeons and how we learn and how that might impact on uh, the, the diversity of minimal access surgery. But we've got a, uh, his presentation next is um, respecting the mitral valve and the patient. Thank you. We can roll the video. Thanks, Ish. Uh, appreciate the invite, and I think I've pre-recorded my talk, so hopefully it'll come on shortly. Good morning, everybody, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of the SCTS University for inviting me to give this uh, talk on a particularly uh, top, a particularly uh, 
good topic that I kind of enjoy, which is called res respecting the mitral valve and the patient. I'm a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon in Blackpool. I'd like to start off by pointing out that what most surgeons know that the mitral valve is a very complex interplay between multiple aspects, starting with the annulus to which the leaflets are attached and to the cords which are attached to the leaflets, the cords then go into papillary muscles, which then are attached to the ventricle. And a problem at any of these uh, levels can cause uh, a problem with the mitral valve function. And as a surgeon, we have to be prepared to address each and every one of these. And I'd like to quickly touch upon some of these aspects as I go along in this talk. The annulus is extremely important and probably under, uh, under uh, valued by some uh, clinicians who treat the mitral valve. Quite often the annulus is dilated and sometimes all you have is annular dilatation with poor leaflet coaptation causing mitral regurgitation. Now this is a picture I took out of the book from uh, David Adams uh, and Alain Carpentier's book about mitral repair and it shows that there were multiple attempts at trying to get mitral valve repairs going and it really only became reproducible and uh, durable after Carpentier introduced the idea of a ring holding the annulus in a systolic position. And this is a very important aspect of our repair, which we should always be uh, mindful and aware of. So the mitral annulus, if it dilates, or if there is a condition called disjunction, which I'll come to, it is very crucial that we fix the annulus so that it doesn't dilate further. So annular, mitral annular dilatation, this is a MRI picture of it. It's uh, quite a sort of uh, simple picture where really all that's happening is leaflets don't meet at rest. And particularly if you put them through an exercise echo, you realize that the regurgitation gets better. Most of these patients come to us from the electrophysiologists because they first present with atrial fibrillation and often they're put down as having moderate mitral regurgitation. But if they have an exercise echo, it'll be quite visible that the mitral regurgitation fraction goes up. And these patients are very good at, for, from our point of view to be treated by just respecting the annulus and putting a slightly undersized annuloplasty ring, which fixes the annulus and prevents the leaflets uh, from uh, not coapting and reduces the risk of uh, regurgitation both at rest and at exercise. And at the same time, they can have an atrial fibrillation ablation too. The other condition I want to talk about is mitral annular disjunction. It is not a new idea. It was first put forward in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1986 on a, a cadaver study of about, I think, 60 to 100 patients, where they had showed that a floppy mitral valve, or what we call Barlow disease, is very often associated with disjunction of the mitral annulus. And the thing with this is that the posterior leaflet appears to move away from the ventricle into the atrium, and you get this condition where the posterior leaflet seems to open out. And this is uh, often, uh, this often leads to a condition where in systole, the valve is actually larger than in diastole, which is opposite to normal. And this leads to what we would class as bileaflet prolapse. And the real uh, beauty of this condition is that if you just put a very large annuloplasty ring, you can get quite good uh, result with coaptation of the leaflets. Now, this uh, sometimes there's uh, so much leaflet tissue that you may have to resect or you may even have to put cords to shorten the posterior leaflet to avoid SAM. But in a large proportion of patients, you just have to put a large annuloplasty ring and that brings the leaflets together and gets rid of the mantle and their disjunction. And this is another form of respecting the annulus without going uh, into the leaflets, etc. where this is a condition of the uh, annular problem. 
Now, leaflets in mitral regurgitation is very complicated. Uh, as much as uh, people say it's posterior leaflet prolapse, as again, David Adams and Wokma Fark and Raphael Rosenheck uh, wrote in a very good article about 12 years ago, 11 years ago, it is a spectrum and it can start with just fibroelastic deficiency. And these sort of uh, leaflets right at the one's end of the spectrum are not very good for resection because if you resect, you don't have enough leaflet tissue to get good coaptation. And they're ideal for the respect technique where you use artificial cords. Now, as you come to the Barlow spectrum, as I mentioned, you could use a large ring, but if you're at this right end of the spectrum, then you are probably committed to resecting some amount of that posterior leaflet because otherwise you could have SAM or you could even have a lot of tissue inside the annulus and prevent uh, good uh, leaflet opening. So you have to use different techniques, but a, a proportion, and I would say a large proportion of patients, you can repair the leaflets without having to resect by just using cortex cords. Now I'll just do uh, show you this quick video of a patient who actually came to us after a resection, so a few years after resection, with a ruptured cord. And this sort uh, of patient is a typical one where it's much easier to re-repair uh, with a uh, Gore-Tex cord because re-resecting that posterior leaflet would leave you with too little tissue to get a good uh, coaptation surface. And as you can see, we put uh, three pairs of cortex cords, and then we put a ring and get a good result. <coughs> this patient had a very small anterior leaflet, and hence uh, we ended up with a undersized ring of Physio 228 with a good result on testing. Now, Sometimes the respect in the mitral valve can be complicated because there are multiple problems. Here you have a P2 prolapse with a flail segment, and the TOE shows that uh, the anterior leaflet is not that big. But when we go in to have a look at the annulus, so we were not surprised by this, we were expecting it because we had done a CT scan. We noticed that the patient had some amount of calcification in the annulus. Now, the annular calcification can be a problem, uh, particularly as this patient was somewhat old and frail, and one option was to resect the calcification, but we chose to, to respect the annulus and the leaflets and just work around it. The other thing is looking to find where the ruptured cord comes from, and you can find it's from a particular head of the papillary muscle, and so we then anatomically replace with artificial cords exactly from the point that the rupture occurred. And again, this is a form of respect where you're respecting the anatom uh, anatomical sort of uh, points in the leaf, in the ventricle and the papillary muscle. So we then use artificial cords with uh, predetermined length of loops. And once we've got this uh, tied down, we just resuspend the leaflets. Now, one of the questions that comes up a lot is what is the ideal length of artificial cords. And you can use all sorts of techniques to measure the, uh, the length. It, of course, depends on the height of the posterior leaflet. It depends on the size of the ventricle. But this particular paper from 1970 talks about the average length of chordae tendinae of the mitral valve. And it gives you a good idea because most cords to the anterior leaflet are between 1.75 and 1.86 centimeters. And of course, you have to add a few millimeters to the depth in the papillary muscle and the depth in the leaflet. So we generally use between 10, 22 and 24 millimeter cords for the anterior leaflet. And as you can see in the posterior leaflet, it's generally between 1.4 and 1.2. Two, and we generally use either 12, 16, or 20 millimeter cords, depending on how long the posterior leaflet is and how big the ventricle is. I would say most of our cords are 16 millimeter for the posterior leaflet, and it seems to work well, though this is not, it is just a rule of thumb. It's not a, a definite uh, for every patient. Now, I do want to mention the heads of the papillary muscle. Uh, we have to respect those. 
And for this, I like to refer to the Durand classification uh, rather than the Carpentier classification. And Durand's classification is very neat in the fact that it divides the mitral valve into two halves based on the papillary muscles. So you have muscle one and muscle two. And of course, muscle one may have multiple heads and muscle two may have multiple heads. But the important thing is that the cortex cords should not cross this midline. And so if you have ruptures from one side or the other side, it's very important to respect that geometry and put your sutures into the muscle on the side of the rupture or the elongation rather than cross the midline. And this is one of the reasons when you have a papillary muscle head rupture and there is no alternative head on that side, it is very hard to repair because you do not want to cross your sutures across this midline and the results are not durable if you did. So I just want to make that point of the Durand classification. Now here's another example of respecting the papillary muscle head origin, because when you do the echo, you only see the biggest head, but as soon as you have cardioplegia the heart and you have an endoscope of the ventricle, you can see there are multiple heads, and actually the rupture is from the posterior most head quite deep down, and so you can really identify it and match it, particularly from the right spot, so that uh, the cords will act very anatomically once they're tied down interest of time, I'll move ahead. In, uh, the final thing I'd like to mention is respecting the ventricle. Uh, certainly, we're increasingly doing beating heart mitral repairs in patients with either poor ventricles or in patients with patent grafts who are coming for the redo. And this is quite a useful technique because you can uh, find again uh, the the area where you want to replace the cord from, and then basically do it while the heart's beating. This keeps the heart perfused, the ventricles tone. The only important thing in this condition is to de-air the ventricle thoroughly at the end, and we use a suction device, which we leave in the ventricle till the TOE shows a lack of uh, any uh, air in the ventricle, and then we take it out. This is us just resuspending a very tall posterior leaflet, again with 16 millimeter cords, uh, which are predetermined lengths. These are made by Cryolife, and uh, these are quite useful in spreading the tension across the leaflet and uh, reducing the risk of SAM. Now, as long as you go from the posterior papillary muscle head and the cords are not too long, you're unlikely to have SAM. Now, once we've tied the posterior leaflet, we do put our ring sutures and put in an annuloplasty band, either a CG future band or a complete ring. I think in this patient, we decided to put a complete ring. So the final thing I'd like to talk about is respecting the chest wall of the patient. You know, uh, quite often people talk about these approaches, which are sternotomy, mini thoracotomy, and totally endoscopic or periareolar incisions as competitive approaches. We certainly don't believe that is the case. Uh, nearly all of us uh, surgeons have started off with sternotomy. We've gradually moved to a mini thoracotomy approach where we have used retractors to be able to see through the hole, and then gradually moved to a fully endoscopic approach where we then can make incisions that are smaller because uh, you don't have to have the focal distance of your eye sight to look through. The percentage of MIS micro cases that I do over the years, it's never really crossed about 80%. So even though I've been doing minimal access for more than 12 years, there's always patients that I choose to do a stenotomy and patients that are better off and safer with stenotomy. And most often these are patients with complex uh, annular calcification or with uh, patients who have very bad iliofemoral disease or patients who have uh, concerns that I may not be able to do a very good uh, repair endoscopically. But over time, there is a gradual trend of doing more and more patients MIS as both expertise and technology and the patient imaging uh, becomes better. So nearly always patient, uh, surgeons move from stenotomy to a mini thoracotomy with a, uh, a retractor in place. 
this is quite good, but there's still some spread of the ribs and there's still some amount of pain that occurs for the patient post-op. But the real benefits come when you move to a totally endoscopic approach where you then just have two to three, uh, three to four ports and uh, you can have the patients recover much quicker and better with much less pain. Now, it is also a very elegant option, redo surgery, and we've done over 60 patients who've had previous tenotomy, and what surprises me always is how much the patient compares the patient journey from the first time to the second time, and gives us a feedback that it's a lot more smoother, especially after they get home and their recovery in the community is much quicker without a redo stenotomy or uh, without uh, putting the sternum apart. Of course, again, there is an element of patient selection and this has to be done carefully. Now, the big question is, should this be done only in large centers? And nearly always you hear the argument that uh, minimally invasive surgery should be done in established centers. And there is a, a good argument to support that. But I'd like to make the point, and Mr. Kermani, one of my junior colleagues, uh, when he was with us, wrote this very good paper, which is just about to be published in the Royal College of Surgeons of England Annals. And it shows that really, when we started off, we were doing less than 20 cases for the first four years. And uh, we still managed to establish a practice of uh, minimally invasive mitral valve surgery over time. And to be fair, if you look very carefully at the Leipzig experience or the Alst experience in Belgium, they too started off at very low numbers. But of course, if you are in a large center like the Cleveland Clinic, then starting a minimal access program is always easier and it's often much more uh, supported, uh, but it can also be done in a small volume center but with time, the volumes do go up. Is it safe is the next question. Uh, in our experience, it is. This is also a slide from the Kirmani paper. We kept a very close eye on our QSIM curves, and this is a curve that predicts a specific outcome for a combination of events like mortality, stroke, reoperation, conversion to stenotomy, renal failure, and I think re-intubation. And you can see we have, uh, apart from the first or second patient that we had a conversion, our trend has always been below what is expected. And you can see that it is quite safe in over 300 patients. And I would recommend that all surgeons keep a close eye on their learning curve, because as the Leipzig group have showed, it is not for all surgeons and all centers, and it's best that you find out yourself first rather than somebody else points it out to you. Finally, uh, I'd like to point out a propensity match analysis that uh, Stuart Grant did when he was with us where he approached uh, Liverpool, Middlesbrough, and Blackpool. And we got uh, close to 600 patients of minimally invasive, and we propensity matched it with stenotomy patients. This was not to prove that one is better than the other. It was primarily to prove that it was a safe approach. And one thing that's interesting is the cross-clamp times and the cardiopulmonary bypass times were longer in the minimal access group. But as you can see, all the outcomes were more or less the same. And uh, the survival at eight years was uh, equally good. And so we do not believe that this approach is detrimental to selected patients. Now in Blackpool, we've looked at our first close to 400 patients and compared it to the stenotomy cohort. Now I must mention that the stenotomy cohort are different and they're selected to some extent, but the important uh, takeaway message is that 10 years, we still find that both males and females having a minimal access approach do just as well, if not slightly better than a sternotomy approach. And uh, this could be argued that it's because of selection, but the point we're trying to make is that even during a learning curve phase, which this graph captures, it doesn't put patients at harm and it is a reasonably safe approach. Now, the only way we could find out if the patients do better or worse from a minimal access approach would be to randomize these patients. And for a long time, it is considered impossible to do that until Enoch and his research team convinced uh, over 10 centers across the UK to contribute to the UK mini mitral trial. And we're quite excited that it is just about to finish recruiting this month. And I hope we'll have some strong results one way or the other in the coming year regarding sternotomy versus minimal access for mitral repair. 
finally, I'm going to finish off by saying endoscopic cardiac surgery not only respects the patient and not only respects the mitral valve, it also respects the trainee. Often I find trainees standing opposite the surgeon, occasionally getting a view of half of the mitral valve over the shoulder of a... That's my 20 minutes coming up. Uh, but an endoscopic approach gives them a very good view. And it also respects the trainer who's able to sit and ergonomically uh, protect his uh, neck and back while doing the case. And of course, the cosmetic results are great. I'm going to finish off by saying, uh, please be in touch with this group that has been formed recently called the Endoscopic Cardiac Surgeons Club, which is to try and uh, popularize this approach and also attract industry to make these procedures both reproducible and safe. Thank you very much for, for your time and look forward to any questions. Prakash, do you, uh, I'm going to hand to Prakash, but if you just put your mic on, Prakash, please. Um, I, I, th I think I think I was very nervous about Prakash's questions, so I think I'm glad his mic is muted. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same. Um, uh, what we'll do is maybe uh, Frank, Frank. Frank's got a quick question that will put me on the spot. If you just get your mic on, or you can tap your question into the. Uh, can you hear me? Can Frank, you hear me? can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Joe. Lovely presentation. Well done. Very nice work. A couple of comments. Why don't you put your anaplasty sutures in before you start repairing the leaflets? You'll get a much better view. And secondly, why do you only size on the anterior leaflets? actually obviating all the good work you've done on the posterior leaflet and present, presenting the patient with relative mitral stenosis at the end of the operation. Thank you, Frank. Is, but those are very good questions. The first one, the answer is, uh, as somebody said, if you put the annuloplasty sutures right at the start, sometimes you feel like you're in a forest with trees crossing your path. And as much as it's fun... Not with the chest open, forest. Joe. <laughs> Sorry? Not with the chest open. <laughs> yeah, not with the chest open for sure, but an endoscopic technique. And the second point is a very good one that you make. That when I started, my biggest uh, uh, aim was to get a competent valve. But with increasing experience and realizing how important the annulus, the posterior leaflet, the clefts, is, and you really described that very well in your talk, I am starting to put larger and larger bands and less and less complete rings. So I think I am moving to yeah. your point over time. And I think you're right. It's, it is a case of getting mature and understanding the mitral valve is more than just a trapdoor. So if, if, you, if you do that, and when you test at the end, and you, you, if you do use the dye test, you see the height of your coaptation. If you've got 0.8 to a centimeter coaptation, then size on the whole surface area of the valve, because you're not going to change it. And you'll end up with a more physiological function. But I enjoyed your talk very much and congratulations for the work you've done on introducing and making minimal access surgery safe for more people. It's very good work. Well done. It means a lot to me, Frank. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you. I don't know whether we have still time, Ish, uh, but just a quick two points, uh, Joe. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really elegant. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Many congratulations. Uh, the first point quickly is about the mitral annular disjunction, which you talked about. It's really very good uh, that you we are starting to look at it. There's a recent publication at the European Heart Journal, which I was invited to review, and then I wrote an invited commentary just to say that after a lot of CT and MRI, they found that 96% of the hearts examined had some element of mitral annular disjunction from four millimeters to 10. It's only when it crossed more than 10 millimeters, so there is some pathologic. So it's, it seems to exist uh, in almost everybody. And as Frank alluded initially, perhaps due to the development uh, pouches, uh, there remains a gap there. Um, secondly, um, many congratulations again for setting up, and Enoch will tell us about the results of that. But my uh, only point that I would like to know is you accepted that there is a high 
bypass and cross clamp time. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, uh, you know, we may not be um, comparing apples with oranges, but in terms of complexity of valve, how complex are the valves that you do? Because, you know, in stonotomy, we do anything and everything. And secondly, in terms of concomitant procedures, I know time is a bit short, but feel free to uh, adapt the answer. Yeah, I think I'll be, I'll answer it very short. I think with increasing experience, you can cope with increasing complexity. And we certainly are publishing our tricuspid and mitral series. Again, early in our experience, we're getting patients very late in their pathway, so more patients needed tricuspid. Now we're getting patients much early, so their tricuspids are not involved, but that is not a exclusion criteria. And certainly AF is quite straightforward to manage, so that wouldn't be a problem. But in the interest of time, I think I'll just be quick with that. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, so um, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is me, Mr. Enoch Akua from Middlesbrough um, uh, South Tees Trust. Um, Enoch has been a real tour de force in progressing clinical trials in the UK. And that has been everything from enhanced recovery through to minimal access surgery. Um, and he's been the lead uh, in the UK mini mitral trial. So this morning, uh, Enoch is going to give us a summary for the evidence behind minimally invasive surgery. Thank you.
So I think while everybody is getting ready, thanks Enoch for a fantastic presentation. That uh, was great. Ish, is your microphone working by now? It should be. Excellent. Uh, did, did you have a question, Justin? Or, or sh no, I don't, I don't have a question. I, I, was, I, mean, I would have many questions, but I don't think we have time to really go into yeah. them. Um, there has been one question in the Slido chat here where uh, people said, how do you start uh, a program from scratch? Uh, that's not easy to answer, but uh, if anybody has a question, I have uh, pretty much experience with that from starting from scratch from very long or earlier time. Uh, just send me an email. I'm right. happy to answer it. And then I'm sure there are others here, Joe and everybody else can do the same. You can just approach us. Thank you, Torsten. You know, that was, that was a really great talk. It gave a fantastic summary of, of where we're at. Um, I don't have any specific questions from um, the panel. Um, what, one thing I think, and I know you have accounted for pretty much every bias that, that there could be in this difficult task of comparing, but was there any, uh, specific requirements uh, in terms of the actual technique of doing the procedure, for example, using anti-grade perfusion rather than femoral perfusion with the literature differences in stroke rate or any uh, or uh, mandating that CT is part of the investigation, et cetera, to, for patient selection. I'm just wondering if we could reassure anybody out there if they have questions like that. Yeah, thanks, Ish. No, it's it's a fairly pragmatic study. So we had some definitions of what a mini mitral operation should be. Clearly a small mini thoracotomy, clearly peripheral uh, cannulation, clearly using a, a camera, clearly using long instruments, etc. But we mandated very little else. Um, it's it's a fairly open and pragmatic study. I think that issue around stroke, that's an interesting, interesting statement. You make the assumption that stroke is worse than minim, minim, minimal access surgery and retrograde perfusion. I'm not sure that's a, a true statement anymore. Um, actually, the last data that I saw was the large series from the STS looking at all minimum invasive um, operations comparing retrograde and anti-grade perfusion, and there was no difference in stroke. So I think that paper from GAMI, which is really quite old now, uh, it was in one of um, it was one of those papers using Paul's meta-analysis, and Paul's meta-analysis was published in 2008. So GAMI's paper was obviously before that. That's quite an old paper, and I, I just think with new techniques, with CT scanning, et cetera, that statement is, is quite simply not true. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, you know, and I think a lot of it comes down to patient selection. I know we, when we, we started our program here, the CT it was really key in helping to select those patients out, and I think that has been illustrated by very, the New York Registry, which came just after the, the GAMI paper. Um, I will allow Prakash in, and, um, and then we'll go into the final presentation. Just quickly, you know, once again, many congratulations for getting this on and completing the recruitment. Uh, at the last AATS, uh, there was a full small session on the uptake, as you, as you quite rightly sort of said, uh, which unfortunately still lacks in the US as well. But one of the arguments and the discussion points was, um, which you very well said in the first few slides, which was, why would anybody want a sternotomy when you can have a small incision. And I think that argument in terms of cosmesis needs to be defined in science or scientifically rather than pure cosmesis. And I think that's where the crux lies. I'm actually quite open and I think there is a future for a highly selected now and maybe wider group later as time passes. But the focus and the emphasis has to move on from purely cosmesis as in recovery and exactly the points that you're looking in many mitral but the uptake um, whilst uh, growing uh, still can go a lot further and I, I just want to congratulate that we are hopefully uh, you know one of the world's only randomized clinical trial and let's see hopefully we get some positive output thank you you're welcome I think can I just make one final point I think your 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 your, your statement is very because true that I'm frequently challenged by stenotomy surgeons. Like you say the patients would always choose mini. Why, why do you say that? What's the evidence for that? And actually that, that stimulated me to, to, to um, um, apply for funding for another trial, which is just to do what's called a discrete choice experiment. So there is a scientific way of answering that question. Uh, it uses health economic techniques, but 
but we can prove that patients actually do prefer mini over stenotomy. And again, data is required, but that work can be done and hopefully will be done as well. Um, but yes, we, we, we need to be able to back that statement up. I agree. Absolutely. Thoroughly enjoyed and look forward to further debates in the future. I'm very happy for data discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ish. Thank you, everybody. So we're moving on to our final presentation. I'm really pleased to have Torsten Dunst uh, here today. Uh, he's Professor of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Jena in Germany. He's been a senior surgeon in Leipzig and has now established an international academic program there. And not only has he done that, as well as maintaining his own surgical expertise, but he has a program which is encouraging and, and supporting developing academic surgeons to continue uh, their work. So it's uh, with real pleasure today that I, I welcome Torsten. His talk is on minimally invasive double valve surgery. Thank you, looking forward to hearing it.
and certainly it requires some mixed expertise in order to account for the longer plant and bypass time. So uh, be prepared, train your regular pre procedures. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention. Wow, Torsten, that was uh, an incredible show of what is possible through through minimal access techniques. It really takes a dedicated individual to take it to that level, um, as well as demonstrating the literature behind it. Um, I, I do have one question uh, off the off the uh, platform, and, and maybe some others. Um, one one question that is commonly brought up when in the UK, we look at the trajectory of our minimal access experience compared to the US and and Germany in particular, is that the UK just seems to be so, so far behind in its adoption in comparison to some German centers. I'm wondering, I know you don't work here, but you, you we welcome you a lot into our meetings. I'm wondering if you've managed to pick up anything in terms of how how do you do it so well in Germany? Um, and is it is it only limited to certain centres, or are there uh, moderate scale centres which are also having the same uptake as you described? Yeah, uh, thanks, Ish. I think um, the uh, the fact that this is so much um, so much in evolved in in Germany and has evolved in the past, I think it has to do with. Uh, specifically one person and that has been my former boss in Leipzig because he has been one of the pioneers of this minimally invasive approach. He started initially with the robot but then they you know Falkmar Falk and, and all these guys they, they uh, abandoned it again because they didn't really saw the value for it in, um, in cardiac surgery. Um, but I think you know the key is uh, Moore has been a great leader and he has been a great influencer of people and his, his disciples so to speak uh, have um, moved into different leadership positions in Germany, and one quarter of uh, German German cardiac surgery departments are run by uh, former Leipzig people. So that uh, they have all, or most of them, have had uh, exposure to minimally invasive approaches and have um, have uh, um, sort of taken that with them. And in addition, several others have developed their own expertise in it and so there has been uh, that's probably the reason and but if i see the the way uh, uh you and great britain are developing right now i mean and what joe is doing is absolutely fantastic and i don't think i don't think there is a difference uh, specifically if i see the the principles uh, that are being applied at the valves i mean that is so convincing to me. I mean, I wouldn't have to add much to, for instance, what uh, uh, Joe just said, and and all the your scientific approach from from Enoch is is fantastic. So, um, I don't think there is. Uh, you don't have to feel bad for being behind. That's just a, a perception. I think it's important to just do it. You know, that's uh, I guess what it what it is. Uh, be responsible about your actions and just do it then. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Torsten. What what one um. Consistent theme coming through is about people interested in starting programs, and I think um, you know anybody in the UK that there is a that there's a a group the Bismix group that is out there to tr really try and help people safely adopt programs, and a lot of it is is about the surgery, but also it's about setting up the patient and learning about patient selection and getting a a process in place in your units where there's the appropriate radiology, appropriate referral pathways, good MDTs to get the right patient into the right type of procedure, whether that's minimal access, whether that's transcatheter um, or, or virus stenotomy. And, um, uh, and I think in that way, um, with the support that Prismix offer here, um, I think the, the younger surgeons can continue to develop. Right. I think, you know, if it comes to the surgery itself is the same as open sternotomy. So the key, and that is also the, the key uh, message that we as surgeons in general should sort of push. The patient needs two things. He needs a competent valve. And in order to get this, he needs a competent surgeon. And the access actually doesn't make a difference. And if, you know, one person generates a perfectly competent and durable valve through a sternotomy, then I would like to get a sternotomy. 
rather than having the minimally invasive guy pre prepare something that is not appropriate. You know, so that is exactly the, the key principle. And once you have s sort of embraced this and you embrace this with that perception, you embrace minimally invasive surgery, then you can achieve all the things that people have shown. And I'm not one, I'm, not, I'm only one of them. But the key is what you, you, the repair that you generate has to be durable. And that is the key message right now. And with that, I mean, everybody, many people have shown this, that uh, ex surgeon expertise plays a role and not only with minimally invasive. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Well, one thing that I remember when we started our program with the scrub nurses, I always try to encourage the team to realize that the operation is the same. The, 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 the pretty much all the sutures and the kit is pretty much right. the same with a, with a couple of adjuncts because you want the repair to be exactly as we have learned it to be over the years. Right. It, it's a bit like Joel said it. It, it. You know, the minimally invasive access becomes, has a chance to become a one-man show. Before, you know, you have more mitral valve surgery with access. Also in sternotomy is for the assistant sometimes more difficult to see and so on and so forth. But with minimally invasive, you end up running a one-man show. And if you have assist uh, help from video scopes and so on, that, that also helps. But the key is you're, you're limiting your expertise and you need to have a team that is well played and you need to train your team because you're not always there alone. Thank you. And um, we are uh, out of time now. So I just want to firstly thank all the speakers, um, Frank Wells, uh, Joe Zacharias, Enoch Akua and Torsten. I know Torsten is hanging around for many other sessions. So uh, please... Uh, uh, follow him on our on our, our account, and also my fellow uh, chairs, uh, Torsten Prakash. Thank you very much for a great session. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.